done all that, let's get down to business. Let's pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you that you are a God who cares for people. Father, we know the greatest love you have for us is sending Jesus to be our Lord and Saviour. And we thank you we live this side of the cross to know that. But Father, what took place before Christ came, I thank you for the Old Testament, that Lord, there's portions there that are pointing to Christ coming. But Father, to live in that time, I would not to like to live there. Um, it was hard. But Father, I thank you that even through the Old Testament, you had your remnant of people as you have your remnant of people today. And as we look to this last part of Haggai, Father, let it not be my words, but Father, I pray that your spirit will work in our hearts and write the truth that you want us to know, that through that we can be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever had something like this happen to you? You're driving through Sydney and you've got absolutely lost at your wife's directions. <laughs> I say that because my wife had the map upside down one day. Anyhow, so you pull over and there's a person standing there and you say, hey, do you know how to get us to this particular place? And the person says, yeah, sure I do. Go down three blocks, you come to Macca's, turn right. Go down another three blocks, you come to the big W, you turn left, and it's the first right, and that's where you'll be. And it works out. Have you ever had anything like that happen to you? Isn't it nice to have somebody who can give you a helping hand to find the place you're looking for? Well, this is what is happening in Haggai. People have got lost. God has sent Haggai to be that helping hand to point them in the right direction to focus again back on God. Last time we saw, looked at Haggai last week, we saw the encouraging words that he left the people in chapters 2, 1 to 9. And all the way through that, you can see the focus where Haggai wanted the people back to God, back to God. And we saw how God would work for their benefit in the I statements in verses 6 to 8. So today as we look at the end part, verses 10 to 23, we're going to look at the instructions and, ins and assurance to the people, and that's in... 10 to 19, and then the assurances are a bubble in 20 to 23. So let's look at the instructions and in insurance to the people. It appears that as you read through these verses, it actually falls into two groups, right? The first one is to the priests, and the second group is what God will do. So look at the first one, 10 to 14. This dates about two months after the prophecy of chapter 2, verse 1. The commentators date it around December. So there's the time gap between October and December between the, the, these two oracles. Now, from October to December, it was common for the heavy rains to come. Because of the moisture that is in the ground, the land was soft and therefore was ripe for planting. Farmers would sow their seed and this work would take place up to mid-December. The farmers would have hoped for having a good crop when it comes out. And there's no difference that today with farmers. Farmers look for a bit of rain. They look for the right time to sow their seed, all in the hope of having a good 
harvest. In verses 11 and 14, Haggai seems to be teaching in the temple and he engages in a dialogue with the priest over the matter of ritual that is in the Torah. Now, remember, the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament, right? First five books. As Haggai, at the command of God, asks questions and dialogues with the priest, well, then the people are around listening to what's going on. Look at the first question in verse 12. If a person carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment and that fold touches some, some bread or stew, some wine, oil or other food, does it become consecrated? Now the term consecrated actually means it's been set apart to fulfil a special purpose. It's like when you have, I don't know what you call it, the Lord's Supper or Communion in a church. The bread and the juice has been set apart for the special purpose of remembering Christ's death on the cross. In the Old Testament, animals were set apart for the sin offering. They were consecrated for that. And you can look at Leviticus uh, chapter 6 for that area. But apparently, if the consecrated meat was to come in contact with the priest's robe, then the robe, according to Leviticus 6.27, it had to become holy. Listen to what it says. Whatever touches any of the flesh will become holy, and if any of the blood is spattered on the garment, you must wash it, wash it in the holy place. So that's where they had to wash their garments in the holy place. However, if the garment touched anything else whilst in the holy place, whatever it touched, it did not become holy. You couldn't become holy by touching a cloth. But the reverse, however, is true for defilement. Ritual defilement was passed on by contact like a deduct and contagious disease. Think about it for a second. You're walking through Central Mall, or you're walking through Woolworths in Maria, and someone who has a very contagious disease walks past you. What could happen? Mm. Yeah. This could affect you. Now, how do I use these questions to bring a big point to the people, to bring it to their attention? Verse 14. So it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Whoa. You see, originally the people in Israel had been set apart by God. They had been set apart and they were called to be holy before God. But the nation defiled itself and everything it touched became defiled, including their offerings to God. They, came, they became defiled because they turned their back on God. The result of their defilement was the temple was ruined and it bore witness to the, na the national sin as the people abandoned God for the idols and the nations around them. The Levitical law provided external outward cleansing, not internal cleansing. So for the nation there was no hope under this scheme. Hope could only come from a change in their hearts. And that could only happen if the people would turn back and obey the voice of God. And in this case, the voice of the prophet who was bringing God's word to them. Haggai's rebuke of the people's sin should have convicted them of their sin and encouraged them to return back to God. This would have brought changes in their lifestyle as the people would have trusted and obeyed God's word in what they did. 
And the same applies for us as well. Many think they are right before God. They say things like, I go to church. I hang out with church people. I give to the poor. I live a good life. I haven't done anything wrong. And so on. While doing these things is commended, they do not make us right or clean before God. Let me say it again. Doing good things does not make us right before God. But if we are called by God and have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, then we have been set apart by God to be his children, to be his ambassadors, to be his servants. This means that we are called to walk in obedience to God's word. As 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. If we belong to God, then we are to be obedient to our heavenly Father's words. If we neglect God and act in disobedient, we become contaminated and sin bearers, and this will Give us an unhappy life. And just as an aside, I'm going aside now, I went to a funeral the other day. The second time I've been to a non-Christian funeral and the second time I pulled my hair out. Oh, their spirit flies into the air. Their spirit goes everywhere. Their spirit is free. What does the Bible say? You go to heaven or hell. It is not free. But this sort of teaching is leading people to stay away from God. So let's look at verses 15 to 19, what God will do. Second part. Second part. Haggai's tone changes here. He tells the people to give careful thought to what will happen. From verse 15, they have laid the foundation stone of the temple, right, the first stone. And Haggai is saying, okay, folks, now take special notice of this time. Look at the verse. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. Verse 16 and 17 is telling them to consider the past, how things had gone, in short, bad up the creek, you name it. Everything they endeavoured to do hadn't worked out because God was not in their hearts. So God's hand had been against them. They continued to neglect God in their lives, so God neglected them. In verse 18, God says, From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give care careful thought. You see, that God says two times in that verse, give careful thought. Haggai is in trying to encourage the people to learn from the past. From this day on, at the start of the verse, is reference to laying the foundation stone. And it should have been a turning point in their life to turn their life back to God. As verse 19 says, Is there yet any seed? in the barn until now the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit this is a rhetorical question Haggai is saying is there anything left and the answer has to be no no is there likely 
likelihood of getting a good crop. They don't know. They've planted, but they don't know. That's in God's hand. But there's a beautiful ending in verse 19. Look at it. From this day on, I will bless you. Haggai now encourages the people to reorder their lives. And if they put God back in the right position in their lives, God said he would bless them. Of course, the greatest blessing they could have would be to have a good crop. And here is a major point for us to learn. As we look back over our lives, we see some good points, but we see many, many failures. But when we turn to Jesus and sought forgiveness for our failures, he says, I forgive all of your sins. He said, I am with you. And what we notice is things have got better from the moment we confessed our sins to the Lord and walked in faithfulness to our God. As we look back to the time of our conversion or the time we accepted Christ as our Lord and Saviour, we should be able to say, the Lord has been good to me. He has blessed me in my life. We should be able to say, my life has changed and things have gotten better. More joy, peace, joy and contentment because God promised these to his people. He didn't promise material possessions, just our daily bread. But I need to say here, when a person becomes a Christian, God promises them spiritual blessings and not material ones. So Christians may face trials and tribulations, hardship and disappointments, and even bad health, to name a few. The Christian walk can be hard, but we are called to soldier on all the time, trusting Jesus to uphold his promises to us and particularly the promise he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Hear the promise, sorry, if we said no, our lives haven't changed since we've become a Christian, then you are saying to me that you are not walking in God's way. So what is Haggai saying to you? He's saying exactly the same thing he is saying to the people. Hear the promise of God through Haggai to the people. If you return to God fully, God says from this day, I will bless you. I will bless you. He will not desert us but he will be there to help us in all ways. So now we turn to the assurance of Zerubbabel. Again, notice the tone of the, the verses. It is what God will do. These verses are focused on Zerubbabel's life, and look at them. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign nations. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. The horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant, Zerubbabel, son of Shetel declares the Lord, and I will make you my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Now one could assume Haggai and Zechariah experienced this whole new age to, to dawn in their own lifetime, because they were about that time around Darius. 
But as time passed, Sarah Bubble was not honoured as he expected. These promises were actually passed down in a messianic way. The prophecy had to be transferred to the future Messiah, Jesus. Zerubbabel was faithful and may have been added to those in Hebrews 11.13. Those who look in faith to the fulfilment of God's promise in the coming Messiah. Or he could have been like Abraham who was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God in Hebrews 11.10. The reason I say this is that verses 21-22 echo verses 6 and 7 and they point to Christ's return. So in verse 23, God exalts Zerubbabel, so to speak. Zerubbabel was God's servant, someone special in the eyes of the people, someone whom God loved and honoured. And we know from later, from later generations, they thought very highly of him. How will people remember you? How will they remember me? As God's faithful servants who are endeavouring to encourage others in Christ's way, or are we missing the mark? Can others see your faith radiating God's love out to them? We are called upon to be God's servants and that will only happen when we allow God's spirit to change and rule our hearts so that we can walk in step with the spirit, obeying God's word. That is the only way we can faithfully follow Christ in all that we do. We need to have a vision of who we are and what Christ is going to do in us. Because without a vision, we'll go nowhere. So what can we learn from Haggai today? Well, God is calling upon us to serve him and him only. Not to serve the myriad of so-called gods in this world. The money, the TV, or whatever. We are called to serve him with a whole dedicated heart that loves him. He's encouraging us to walk in obedience to his word so we can encourage others in the same way. But you know, we live in an apathetic country where people would rather do their own things. God will not bless such people and he will hold his blessings back from them. But with a sincere faith in Jesus Christ and stepping out and following him, God will bless our endeavours both now and eternally. He's, he delights in blessing his people. He delights when his people obey his commands. May we all take to heart those words, give careful thought. Consider what God is saying to us and consider our past. May we be willing to learn from our past and grow greater in our love of Christ. And then when we step out in faith to serve him, remember he is with us. He wants to use us, miserable old us, who are sinners, for his glory. And the plans God has for us may take us along some road we never dreamed about. I never dreamed of going into ministry because I lose a lot of money from being a surveyor go to ministry. Have I regretted that? No, I haven't. I've loved it. 
I love serving my Lord. And I've learned to trust him to use me for his glory. Are you trusting, are you asking him to use you for his glory? Trust and love him. And then he'll bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you and praise you that you love us. And Lord, when we look at our lives, Father, we, we are miserable people. We fail you so many times. But in your providence, you have called us and you want to use us. Help us, Lord, to love you more, to trust you more, to follow you and be your servants. And I pray you might guide us and direct us in Jesus' name.